On December 21, 1951, the night shift workers of the New Orient coal mine lined up for work. It was 6 p.m. and their last night of work before Christmas vacation. A sign next to the cave entrance read, Merry Christmas to the night crew. 119 of the 255 miners would not meet their families on Christmas Day. At 7.40 p.m., a night manager on the surface was alerted when all electricity halted and smoke and dust plumed out of shaft number four. When the electricity returned, the manager called to all stations to return to the surface immediately. He could not contact many of the north stations. News of the incident spread quickly through town, as Friday night basketball attended by 2,000 patrons was in session. The townspeople quickly hurried to the mine to assist in rescue efforts. Exploration crews ascended into the mine and restored ventilation. Most of the mine in the area of the explosion was destroyed and bodies were scattered. The mine was gassy, but this wasn't anything new. Just a few months earlier, an inspection report cited mine violations of the Federal Mine Safety Code. Methane had been detected in numerous abandoned entries termed Old Ends. All areas of the mine that were affected by the explosion were ventilated by air that passed these old ends. Three old ends had collapsed recently, releasing excess gas into the mine. To add to the gas issues, empty cars were positioned in a main ventilating door, causing air pressure to reduce in the old ends, releasing gas into the working areas. When the methane was in the working areas in abundance, either an electrical short or a lit cigarette ignited the gas. After 56 hours of pulling bodies from the mine, a voice was heard. My God, there's a man alive. Cecil Sanders lay on a rock fall barely clinging to life. He had been with four other men that died after they tried to escape but were met with black smoke and ash. Cecil climbed on top of the rock and wrote a note to his wife and children. May the good Lord bless and keep you. Dear wife and kids, meet me in heaven. However, others weren't so lucky. Early Monday morning, a body was pulled from the mine. The attendants noticed that the body was still warm. On him, they found a cigarette pack with a note scribbled on the inside to his now widow, Laura. I love you always. I go tonight with Christ. I love him too. At the first battle of the Ain during the Great War, the Camerons formed the battalion headquarters and a makeshift hospital for the wounded in a cave. There were many caves in the area that both the Scottish forces and the Germans used for shelter. This particular cave was large and spacious, perfect for shelter. The cave was situated 300 yards behind the trenches, which was a manageable distance to move the wounded, but kept the cave and the headquarters at a relatively safe distance from the ongoing battle. However, September 25th, while the Germans' artillery were shelling the Cameron positions, a shell from a large German gun struck the roof of the cave. The cave collapsed under the force of the German shell, burying 35 men. The shell hit its mark at 7.30 in the morning. The majority of men were in the trenches 300 yards away battling the Germans. No one knew what had happened, and even if they had, there was no way to get back to the cave under fire. Inside the cave, the majority of men were killed instantly by falling rock. But in the back of the cave, four men remained alive, but trapped. One man, Corporal Mitchell of the First Camerons, was pinned down by a large boulder, but not seriously wounded. He was joined by three other men that were trapped, but had clear path to shout for help. The men shouted for help, but for the first hour and a half, fighting continued and no one would hear their pleas. Three to four Camerons found that the cave had collapsed and began searching the rubble for survivors when they heard the shouting soldiers trapped in the back of the cave. The Camerons made their way to the back of the cave, finding all four soldiers still alive and extremely happy to see them. The three men that had been trapped further toward the front of the cave were quickly freed and made their escape out of the cave. One of the rescuers then brought his attention to Corporal Mitchell and began digging him out. Just as Mitchell was freed, another shell struck. The rescuer was blown apart by the blast, which caused more rock to fall on Corporal Mitchell. 
Mitchell had received shrapnel from the shell and was now seriously wounded, but that was not the worst part. He was now trapped in a sitting position with his knees doubled up and his head bent forward on his arms resting on his knees. He was completely covered and he was struggling to breathe. The men outside that had rescued the other three soldiers were immediately called off to take shelter because the German artillery had become so intense. In the position he was in under the weight of the rocks and with the wounds on his leg, Mitchell was not able to maintain consciousness. At about 1 o'clock p.m., four men of the Scots Guard entered what was left of the cave and began to dig. Two hours later, they discovered Mitchell still breathing. After being buried for six hours after the second explosion and seven and a half hours total, Mitchell was finally free. Corporal Mitchell would go on to make a full recovery, helling the Scots Guard rescuing him under heavy German fire. On September 9, 1889, ten men descended 730 feet into a mine shaft. This mine shaft was separated by a 90-foot barrier to a second inoperable shaft that had slowly been filling with water from a nearby stream. On this day, in 1889, the barrier would fail. Coal was first discovered in Golden, Colorado in 1860. Over the next few decades, many more mines opened in the area, including the giant Ralston Springs on Ralston Creek. Ralston Springs was one of the most prolific mines in the state and brought more and more companies searching for coal closer and closer to the town of Golden. Two mines that opened near the town were the Loveland and the White Ash. By 1889, the White Ash had reached a depth of 730 feet and many satellite shafts had been established. The Loveland mine, sitting just to the north of White Ash, had been an extremely profitable mine until a coal fire forced evacuation and ultimately caused the Loveland to be closed in 1881. After the Loveland was closed, water from nearby Clear Creek seeped in, flooding the two and a half mile underground network. After the Loveland closed in 1881, the White Ash continued to be mined, becoming one of the most profitable mines in the state. Excavation of the White Ash continued to the north toward the now closed Loveland. The miners came within 90 feet of the Loveland. This distance had been previously determined by the mine engineers to be a safe distance between the two mines, leaving a 90-foot barrier between the White Ash and the Loveland. On September 9, 1889, eight years after work was halted at Loveland, the White Ash miners descended for the last time. As usual, the miners gathered at the elevator with their tools and meals for the day and descended into the darkness to perform one of the most dangerous jobs known to man. At about 3.45 that afternoon, engineer Charles Hoagland lowered the elevator to retrieve the miners after a long day. The elevator stopped before reaching the bottom. Initially, Hoagland thought it was a problem with the elevator and tried to raise it. The engines roared, but the elevator didn't move. Hoagland attempted to contact the cage man stationed at the bottom of the elevator to no avail. Hoagland now became worried that something more may be wrong. Hoagland got the attention of the foreman, Evan Jones, who descended by ladder into the vertical shaft. Jones had descended 280 feet when he was overcome by the sound of rushing water from below. He ascended the 280 feet as quickly as possible and notified general manager, Paul Lanius. Word of the disaster spread throughout town, and many townspeople, including families of the miners, came to watch and help any way they could. Jones recruited as many men as he could to help run lights and cables down the shaft so they could descend and attempt to rescue the stranded miners. As they were working ferociously to set the cables, they could occasionally hear the roar of the water overtake screams from below. When the cables were set, Jones descended into the mine. At only 300 feet of the 730-foot depth, Jones was turned back by sulfurous gas. Throughout the night, the crew pumped air to the men below, hoping that at least some could survive. When morning came, Jones and expected John McNeil descended into the mine in a steel bucket. They returned with news everyone expected, but no one wanted. The water was 200 feet deep, and there was nothing that could be done. The shaft was sealed. The ten miners' bodies are entombed in the mine. There are at least two theories as to how this could have happened. The first theory is that the coal fire that had contributed to the closure of the Loveland mine 
had slowly been smoldering for the past eight years, slowly burning a void in the 90-foot barrier between the flooded Loveland and the white ash. A second theory from Inspector McNeil was that a fire from a dump on the surface burned down, following the coal through the cracks in the ground between the two mines, weakening the 90-foot barrier. Either way, on that day, September 1889, the barrier felled and three million cubic feet of water poured into the white ash mine, entombing the men under 200 feet of water. In a field at the west end of 12th Street, where the white ash mine once stood, stands a lone monument dedicated to the ten men that died that day.